The Werewolf by H. B. Marriott My father was not born or originally a resident in the Hartz Mountains. He was a serf of an Hungarian nobleman of great possessions in Transylvania. But although a serf, he was not by any means a poor or illiterate man. In fact, he was rich, and his intelligence and respectability were such that he had been raised by his lord to the stewardship. But whoever may happen to be born a serf, a serf must he remain, even though he become a wealthy man. Such was the condition of my father. My father had been married for about five years, and by his marriage had three children, my eldest brother Caesar, myself, Hermann, and a sister named Marcella. Latin is still the language spoken in that country, and that will account for our high-sounding names. My mother was a very beautiful woman, unfortunately more beautiful than virtuous. She was seen and admired by the lord of the soil. My father was sent away upon some mission, and during his absence my mother, flattered by the attentions and won by the assiduities of this nobleman, yielded to his wishes. It so happened that my father returned very unexpectedly and discovered the intrigue. The evidence of my mother's shame was positive, he surprised her in the company of her seducer. Carried away by the impetuosity of his feelings, he watched the opportunity of a meeting taking place between them and murdered both his wife and her seducer. Conscious that, as a serf, not even the provocation which he had received would be allowed as a justification of his conduct, he hastily collected together what money he could lay his hands upon, and, as we were then in the depth of winter, he put his horses to the sleigh, and taking his children with him, he set off in the middle of the night and was far away before the tragical circumstance had transpired. Aware that he would be pursued, and that he had no chance of escape if he remained in any portion of his native country in which the authorities could lay hold of him, he continued his flight without intermission until he had buried himself in the intricacies and seclusion of the Hartz Mountains. Of course, all that I have now told you I learned afterwards. My oldest recollections are knit to a rude yet comfortable cottage in which I lived with my father, brother, and sister. It was on the confines of one of those vast forests which cover the northern part of Germany. Around it were a few acres of ground which during the summer months my father cultivated and which, though they yielded a doubtful harvest, were sufficient for our support. In the winter we remained much indoors, for, as my father followed the chase, we were left alone, and the wolves during the season incessantly prowled about. My father had purchased the cottage and land about it of one of the rude foresters who gained their livelihood partly by hunting and partly by burning charcoal for the purpose of smelting the ore from the neighboring mines. It was distant, about two miles from any other habitation, I can call to mind the whole landscape now, the tall pines which rose up on the mountain above us, and the wide expanse of forest beneath, on the topmost boughs and heads of whose trees we looked down from our cottage as the mountain below us rapidly descended into the distant valley. In summertime the prospect was beautiful, but during the severe winter a more desolate scene could not well be imagined. I said that in the winter my father occupied himself with the chase. Every day he left us, and often would he lock the door that we might not leave the cottage. He had no one to assist him or to take care of us. Indeed, it was not easy to find a female servant who would live in such a solitude. But could he have found one, my father would not have received her, for he had imbibed a horror of the sex. As a difference of his conduct toward us, his two boys and my poor little sister Marcella evidently proved. You may suppose we were sadly neglected. Indeed, we suffered much, for my father, fearful that we might come to some harm, would not allow us fuel when he left the cottage, and we were obliged, therefore, to creep under the heaps of bear's skin, and there to keep ourselves as warm as we could until he returned in the evening, when a blazing fire was our delight. 
That my father chose this restless sort of life may appear strange, but the fact was that he could not remain quiet, whether from remorse for having committed murder, or from the misery consequent on his change of situation, or from both combined, he was never happy unless he was in a state of activity. Children, however, when left much to themselves, acquire a thoughtfulness not common to their age. So it was with us, and during the short cold days of winter we would sit silent, longing for the happy hours when the snow would melt, and the leaves burst out, and the birds begin their songs, and when we should again be set at liberty. Such was our peculiar and savage sort of life until my brother Caesar was nine, myself seven, and my sister five years old, when the circumstances occurred on which is based the extraordinary narrative which I am about to relate. One evening my father returned home rather later than usual. He had been unsuccessful, and as the weather was very severe and many feet of snow were upon the ground, he was not only very cold but in a very bad humor. He had brought in wood, and we were all three of us gladly assisting each other in blowing on the embers to create the blaze, when he caught poor little Marcella by the arm and threw her aside. The child fell, struck her mouth, and bled very much. My brother ran to raise her up. Accustomed to ill usage and afraid of my father, she did not dare to cry, but looked up in his face very piteously. My father drew his stool near to the hearth, muttered something in abuse of women, and busied himself with a fire, which both my brother and I had deserted when our sister was so unkindly treated. A cheerful blaze was soon the result of his exertions, but we did not, as usual, crowd round it. Marcella, still bleeding, retired to a corner, and my brother and I took our seats beside her, while my father hung over the fire gloomily and alone. Such had been our position for about half an hour when the howl of a wolf close under the window of the cottage fell on our ears. My father started up and seized his gun. The howl was repeated. He examined the priming and then hastily left the cottage, shutting the door after him. We all waited, anxiously listening, for we thought that if he succeeded in shooting the wolf, he would return in a better humor, and although he was harsh to all of us, and particularly so to our little sister, still we loved our father, and loved to see him cheerful and happy, for what else had we to look up to? And I may here observe that perhaps there never were three children who were fonder of each other. We did not, like other children, fight and dispute together. And if by chance any disagreement did arise between my elder brother and me, little Marcella would run to us, and kissing us both, seal through her entreaties the peace between us. Marcella was a lovely, amiable child. I can recall her beautiful features even now. Alas, poor little Marcella. We waited for some time, but the report of the gun did not reach us, and my elder brother then said, Our father has followed the wolf and will not be back for some time. Marcella, let us wash the blood from your mouth, and then we will leave this corner and go to the fire and warm ourselves. We did so, and remained there until near midnight, every minute wondering, as it grew later, why our father did not return. We had no idea that he was in any danger, but we thought that he must have chased the wolf for a very long time. I will look out and see if father is coming, said my brother Caesar, going to the door. Take care, said Marcella. The wolves must be about now, and we cannot kill them, brother. My brother opened the door very cautiously, and but a few inches. He peeped out. I see nothing, said he, after a time, and once more he joined us at the fire. We have had no supper, said I, for my father usually cooked the meat as soon as he came home, and during his absence we had nothing but the fragments of the preceding day. And if our father comes home after his hunt, Caesar, said Marcella, he will be pleased to have some supper. Let us cook it for him and for ourselves. Caesar climbed upon the stool and reached down some meat. I forget now whether it was venison or bear's meat, but we cut off the usual quantity and proceeded to dress it, as we used to do under our father's superintendence. 
We were all busied putting it into the platters before the fire to wait his coming when we heard the sound of a horn. We listened. There was a sound outside, and a minute afterwards my father entered, ushering in a young female and a large dark man in a hunter's dress. Perhaps I had better now relate what was only known to me many years afterwards. When my father had left the cottage, he perceived a large white wolf about thirty yards from him. As soon as the animal saw my father, it retreated slowly, growling and snarling. My father followed. The animal did not run, but always kept at some distance, and my father did not like to fire until he was pretty certain that his ball would take effect. Thus they went on for some time, the wolf now leaving my father far behind, and then stopping and snarling defiance at him, and then again, on his approach, setting off at speed. Anxious to shoot the animal, for the white wolf is very rare, my father continued the pursuit for several hours, during which he continually ascended the mountain. You must know that there are peculiar spots on those mountains which are supposed, and, as my story will prove, truly supposed, to be inhabited by the evil influences. They are well known to the huntsmen who invariably avoid them. Now one of these spots, an open space in the pine forest above us, had been pointed out to my father as dangerous on that account. But whether he disbelieved these wild stories, or whether, in his eager pursuit of the chase, he disregarded them, I know not. Certain, however, it is that he was decoyed by the white wolf to this open space, when the animal appeared to slacken her speed. My father approached, came close up to her, raised his gun to his shoulder, and was about to fire when the wolf suddenly disappeared. He thought that the snow on the ground must have dazzled his sight, and he let down his gun to look for the beast, but she was gone. How she could have escaped over the clearance without his seeing her was beyond his comprehension. Mortified at the ill success of his chase, he was about to retrace his steps when he heard the distant sound of a horn. Astonishment at such a sound, at such an hour, in such a wilderness, made him forget for the moment his disappointment, and he remained riveted to the spot. In a minute the horn was blown a second time, and at no great distance. My father stood still and listened. A third time it was blown. I forget the term used to express it, but it was the signal which my father well knew implied that the party was lost in the woods. In a few minutes more my father beheld a man on horseback, with a female seated on the crupper, enter the cleared space, and ride up to him. At first my father called to mind the strange stories which he had heard of the supernatural beings who were said to frequent these mountains, but the near approach of the parties satisfied him that they were mortals like himself. As soon as they came up to him, the man who guided the horse accosted him. Friend Hunter, you are out late, the better fortune for us. We have ridden far and are in fear of our lives, which are eagerly sought after. These mountains have enabled us to elude our pursuers, but if we find not shelter and refreshment, that will avail us little, as we must perish from hunger and the inclemency of the night. My daughter, who rides behind me, is now more dead than alive. Say, can you assist us in our difficulty? My cottage is some few miles distant, replied my father, but I have little to offer you besides a shelter from the weather. To the little I have, you are welcome. May I ask whence you come? Yes, friend, it is no secret now. We have escaped from Transylvania, where my daughter's honor and my life were equally in jeopardy. This information was quite enough to raise an interest in my father's heart. He remembered his own escape. He remembered the loss of his wife's honor and the tragedy by which it was wound up. He immediately and warmly offered all the assistance which he could afford them. There is no time to be lost then, good sir, observed the horseman. My daughter is chilled with the frost and cannot hold out much longer against the severity of the weather. Follow me, replied my father, leading the way towards his home. I was lured away in pursuit of a large white wolf, observed my father. It came to the very window of my hut, or I should not have been out at this time of night. The creature passed by us just as we came out of the wood, said the female in a silvery tone. 
I was nearly discharging my piece at it, observed the hunter, but since it did us such good service, I am glad that I allowed it to escape. In about an hour and a half, during which my father walked at a rapid pace, the party arrived at the cottage and, as I said before, came in. We are in good time, apparently, observed the dark hunter, catching the smell of the roasted meat as he walked to the fire and surveyed my brother and sister and myself. You have young cooks here, mynheer. I am glad that we shall not have to wait, replied my father. Come, mistress, seat yourself by the fire. You require warmth after your cold ride. And where can I put up my horse, mynheer, observed the huntsman. I will take care of him, replied my father, going out of the cottage door. The female must, however, be particularly described. She was young and apparently twenty years of age. She was dressed in a traveling dress, deeply bordered with white fur, and wore a cap of white ermine on her head. Her features were very beautiful, at least I thought so, and so my father has since declared. Her hair was flaxen, glossy and shining, and bright as a mirror, and her mouth, although somewhat large when it was open, showed the most brilliant teeth I have ever beheld. But there was something about her eyes, bright as they were, which made us children afraid. They were so restless, so furtive. I could not at that time tell why, but I felt as if there was cruelty in her eye, and when she beckoned us to come to her, we approached her with fear and trembling. Still, she was beautiful, very beautiful. She spoke kindly to my brother and myself, patted our heads and caressed us, but Marcella would not come near her. On the contrary, she slunk away and hid herself in the bed and would not wait for the supper, which half an hour before she had been so anxious for. My father, having put the horse into a closed shed, soon returned and supper was placed upon the table. When it was over, my father requested that the young lady would take possession of his bed, and he would remain at the fire and sit up with her father. After some hesitation on her part, this arrangement was agreed to, and I and my brother crept into the other bed with Marcella, for we had as yet always slept together. But we could not sleep. There was something so unusual, not only in seeing strange people, but in having those people sleep at the cottage, that we were bewildered. As for poor little Marcella, she was quiet, but I perceived that she trembled during the whole night, and sometimes I thought that she was checking a sob. My father had brought out some spirits, which he rarely used, and he and the strange hunter remained drinking and talking before the fire. Our ears were ready to catch the slightest whisper, so much was our curiosity excited. You said you came from Transylvania, observed my father. Even so, mine hair, replied the hunter. I was a serf to the noble house of blank. My master would insist upon my surrendering up my fair girl to his wishes. It ended in my giving him a few inches of my hunting knife. We are countrymen and brothers in misfortune, replied my father, taking the huntsman's hand and pressing it warmly. Indeed, are you then from that country? Yes, and I too have fled for my life, but mine is a melancholy tale. Your name? inquired the hunter. Kranz. What? Kranz of blank? I have heard of your tale. You need not renew your grief by repeating it now. Welcome, most welcome, mine heir, and I may say my worthy kinsman. I am your second cousin, Wilfred of Barnsdorf, cried the hunter, rising up and embracing my father. They filled their horn mugs to the brim and drank to one another after the German fashion. The conversation was then carried on in a low tone. All that we could collect from it was that our new relative and his daughter were to take up their abode in our cottage, at least for the present. In about an hour they both fell back in their chairs and appeared to sleep. Marcella, dear, did you hear? said my brother in a low tone. Yes, replied Marcella in a whisper. I heard all. Oh, brother, I cannot bear to look upon that woman. I feel so frightened. My brother made no reply, and shortly afterwards we were all three fast asleep. When we woke the next morning, we found that the hunter's daughter had risen before us. I thought she looked more beautiful than ever. She came up to little Marcella and caressed her. The child burst into tears and sobbed as if her heart would break. But... Not to detain you with too long a story, the huntsman and his daughter were accommodated in the cottage. My father and he went out hunting daily, leaving Christina with us. 
She performed all the household duties, was very kindly to us children, and gradually the dislike even of little Marcella wore away. But a great change took place in my father. He appeared to have conquered his aversion to the sex and was most attentive to Christina. Often, after her father and we were in bed, would he sit up with her, conversing in a low tone by the fire. I ought to have mentioned that my father and the huntsman Wilfred slept in another portion of the cottage, and that the bed which he formerly occupied, and which was in the same room as ours, had been given up to the use of Christina. These visitors had been about three weeks at the cottage, when, one night, after we children had been sent to bed, a consultation was held. My father had asked Christina in marriage, and had obtained both her own consent and that of Wilfred. After this, a conversation took place, which was as nearly as I can recollect as follows. You may take my child, mein Herr Kranz, and my blessing with her, and I shall then leave you and seek some other habitation. It matters little where. Why not remain here, Wilfred? No, no, I am called elsewhere. Let that suffice, and ask no more questions. You have my child. I thank you for her, and will duly value her. But there is one difficulty. I know what you would say. There is no priest here in this wild country. True, neither is there any law to bind. Still must some ceremony pass between you to satisfy a father. Will you consent to marry her after my fashion? If so, I will marry you directly. I will, replied my father. Then take her by the hand. Now, mein Herr, swear. I swear, repeated my father. By all the spirits of the Hartz Mountains. Nay, why not by heaven, interrupted my father. Because it is not my humor, rejoined Wilfred. If I prefer that oath, less binding perhaps than another, surely you will not thwart me. Well, be it so then. Have your humor. Will you make me swear by that in which I do not believe? Yet many do so, who in outward appearance are Christians, rejoined Wilfred. Say, will you be married, or shall I take my daughter away with me? Proceed, replied my father impatiently. I swear by all the spirits of the heart's mountains, by all their power for good or for evil, that I take Christina for my wedded wife, that I will ever protect her, cherish her, and love her, that my hand shall never be raised against her to harm her. My father repeated the words after Wilfred, And if I fail in this my vow, may all the vengeance of the spirits fall upon me and upon my children. May they perish by the vulture, by the wolf, or other beasts of the forest. May their flesh be torn from their limbs, and their bones blanch in the wilderness. All this I swear. My father hesitated as he repeated the last words. Little Marcella could not restrain herself, and as my father repeated the last sentence, she burst into tears. This sudden interruption appeared to discompose the party, particularly my father. He spoke harshly to the child, who controlled her sobs, burying her face under the bedclothes. Such was the second marriage of my father. The next morning the hunter Wilfred mounted his horse and rode away. My father resumed his bed, which was in the same room as ours, and things went on much as before the marriage, except that our new mother-in-law did not show any kindness towards us. Indeed, during my father's absence, she would often beat us, particularly little Marcella, and her eyes would flash fire as she looked eagerly upon the fair and lovely child. One night, my sister awoke me and my brother. "'What is the matter?' said Caesar. "'She has gone out,' whispered Marcella." "'Gone out? Yes, gone out at the door in her nightclothes,' replied the child. "'I saw her get out of bed, look at my father to see if he slept, and then she went out at the door. What could induce her to leave her bed, and all undressed to go out in such bitter wintry weather, with snow deep on the ground, was to us incomprehensible. We lay awake, and in about an hour we heard the growl of a wolf close under the window.' "'There's a wolf,' said Caesar. "'She will be torn to pieces.' "'Oh, no,' cried Marcella. "'In a few minutes afterwards, our mother-in-law appeared. "'She was in her nightdress, as Marcella had stated. "'She let down the latch of the door so as to make no noise, "'went to a pail of water, and washed her face and hands, "'and then slipped into the bed where my father lay. 
We all three trembled. We hardly knew why, but we resolved to watch the next night. We did so, and not only on the ensuing night, but on many others, and always at about the same hour would our mother-in-law rise from her bed and leave the cottage, and after she was gone, we invariably heard the growl of a wolf under our window, and always saw her on her return wash herself before she retired to bed. We observed also that she seldom sat down to meals, and that when she did she appeared to eat with dislike, but when the meat was taken down to be prepared for dinner, she would often furtively put a raw piece into her mouth. My brother Caesar was a courageous boy. He did not like to speak to my father until he knew more. He resolved that he would follow her out and ascertain what she did. Marcella and I endeavored to dissuade him from this project, but he would not be controlled. And, the very next night, he lay down in his clothes, and as soon as our mother-in-law had left the cottage, he jumped up, took down my father's gun, and followed her. You may imagine in what a state of suspense Marcella and I remained during his absence. After a few minutes, we heard the report of a gun. It did not awaken my father, and we lay trembling with anxiety. In a minute afterwards, we saw our mother-in-law enter the cottage, her dress was bloody. I put my hand to Marcella's mouth to prevent her crying out, although I was myself in great alarm. Our mother-in-law approached my father's bed, looked to see if he was asleep, and then went to the chimney and blew up the embers into a blaze. Who is there? said my father, waking up. Lie still, dearest, replied my mother-in-law. It is only me. I have lighted the fire to warm some water. I am not quite well. My father turned round and was soon asleep, but we watched our mother-in-law. She changed her linen and threw the garment she had worn into the fire, and we then perceived that her right leg was bleeding profusely as if from a gunshot wound. She bandaged it up and then dressing herself, remained before the fire until the break of day. Poor little Marcella, her heart beat quick as she pressed me to her side, so indeed did mine. Where was our brother Caesar? How did my mother-in-law receive the wound unless from his gun? At last my father rose, and then, for the first time, I spoke, saying, Father, where is my brother Caesar? Your brother? explained he. Why, where can he be? Merciful heaven, I thought as I lay restless last night, observed our mother-in-law, that I heard somebody open the latch of the door. And, dear me, husband, what has become of your gun? My father cast his eyes above the chimney and perceived that his gun was missing. For a moment he looked perplexed. Then, seizing a broad axe, he went out of the cottage without saying another word. He did not remain away from us long. In a few minutes he returned, bearing in his arms the mangled body of my poor brother. He laid it down and covered up his face. My mother-in-law rose up and looked at the body, while Marcella and I threw ourselves by its side, wailing and sobbing bitterly. "'Go to bed again, children,' said she sharply. "'Husband,' continued she, "'your boy must have taken the gun down to shoot a wolf, and the animal has been too powerful for him. Poor boy, he has paid dearly for his rashness.' My father made no reply. I wished to speak, to tell all, but Marcella, who perceived my intention, held me by the arm and looked at me so imploringly that I desisted. My father, therefore, was left in his air, but Marcella and I, although we could not comprehend it, were conscious that our mother-in-law was in some way connected with my brother's death. That day my father went out and dug a grave, and when he laid the body in the earth, he piled up stones over it, so that the wolves should not be able to dig it up. The shock of this catastrophe was to my poor father very severe. For several days he never went to the chase, although at times he would utter bitter anathemas and vengeance against the wolves. But during this time of mourning on his part, my mother-in-law's nocturnal wanderings continued with the same regularity as before. At last my father took down his gun to repair to the force, but he soon returned and appeared much annoyed. Would you believe it, Christina, that the wolves, perdition to the whole race, have actually contrived to dig up the body of my poor boy? Now there is nothing left of him but his bones. Indeed, replied my mother-in-law. Marcella looked at me, and I saw in her intelligent eye all that she would have uttered. 
A wolf growls under our window every night, father, said I. I, indeed. Why did you not tell me, boy? Wake me the next time you hear it. I saw my mother-in-law turn away. Her eyes flashed fire and she gnashed her teeth. My father went out again and covered up with a large pile of stones the little remnants of my poor brother which the wolves had spared. Such was the first act of the tragedy. The spring now came on, the snow disappeared, and we were permitted to leave the cottage, but never would I quit for one moment my dear little sister, to whom since the death of my brother I was more ardently attached than ever. Indeed, I was afraid to leave her alone with my mother-in-law, who appeared to have a particular pleasure in ill-treating the child. My father was now employed upon his little farm, and I was able to render him some assistance. Marcella used to sit by us while we were at work, leaving my mother-in-law alone in the cottage. I ought to observe that, as the spring advanced, so did my mother decrease her nocturnal rambles, and that we never heard the growl of the wolf under the window after I had spoken of it to my father. One day, when my father and I were in the field, Marcella being with us, my mother-in-law came out, saying that she was going into the forest to collect some herbs my father wanted, and that Marcella must go to the cottage and watch the dinner. Marcella went, and my mother-in-law soon disappeared in the forest, taking a direction quite contrary to that in which the cottage stood, and leaving my father and I, as it were, between her and Marcella. About an hour afterwards we were startled by shrieks from the cottage, evidently the shrieks of little Marcella. Marcella has burnt herself, father, said I, throwing down my spade. My father threw down his and we both hastened to the cottage. Before we could gain the door, out darted a large white wolf, which fled with the utmost celerity. My father had no weapon. He rushed into the cottage and there saw poor little Marcella expiring. Her body was dreadfully mangled, and the blood pouring from it had formed a large pool on the cottage floor. My father's first intention had been to seize his gun and pursue, but he was checked by this horrid spectacle. He knelt down by his dying child and burst into tears. Marcella could just look kindly on us for a few seconds, and then her eyes were closed in death. My father and I were still hanging over my poor sister's body when my mother-in-law came in. At the dreadful sight she expressed much concern, but she did not appear to recoil from the sight of blood, as most women do. Poor child, said she, it must have been that great white wolf which passed me just now and frightened me so. She's quite dead, Kranz. I know it, I know it, cried my father in agony. I thought my father would never recover from the effects of this second tragedy. He mourned bitterly over the body of his sweet child, and for several days would not consign it to its grave, although frequently requested by my mother-in-law to do so. At last he yielded, and dug a grave for her close by that of my poor brother, and took every precaution that the wolves should not violate her remains. I was now really miserable as I lay alone in the bed which I had formerly shared with my brother and sister. I could not help thinking that my mother-in-law was implicated in both their deaths, although I could not account for the manner. But I no longer felt afraid of her. My little heart was full of hatred and revenge. The night after my sister had been buried, as I lay awake, I perceived my mother-in-law get up and go out of the cottage. I waited for some time, then dressed myself and looked out through the door, which I half opened. The moon shone bright, and I could see the spot where my brother and my sister had been buried, and what was my horror when I perceived my mother-in-law busily removing the stones from Marcella's grave. She was in her white nightdress, and the moon shone full upon her face. She was digging with her hands and throwing away the stones behind her with all the ferocity of a wild beast. It was some time before I could collect my senses and decide what I should do. At last I perceived that she had arrived at the body and raised it up to the side of the grave. I could bear it no longer. I ran to my father and awoke him. Father, father, cried I, dress yourself and get your gun. What, cried my father, the wolves are there, are they? He jumped out of bed, threw on his clothes, and in his anxiety did not appear to perceive the absence of his wife. As soon as he was ready, I opened the door, he went out, and I followed him. Imagine his horror when, unprepared as he was for such a sight, he beheld as he advanced towards the grave, not a wolf, 
but his wife in her nightdress, on her hands and knees, crouching by the body of my sister, and tearing off large pieces of the flesh, and devouring them with all the avidity of a wolf. She was too busy to be aware of our approach. My father dropped his gun, his hair stood on end, so did mine. He breathed heavily, and then his breath for a time stopped. I picked up the gun, and put it into his hand. Suddenly he appeared as if concentrated rage had restored him to double vigor. He leveled his piece, fired, and with a loud shriek, down fell the wretch whom he had fostered in his bosom. God of heaven, cried my father, sinking down upon the earth in a swoon as soon as he had discharged his gun. I remained some time by his side before he recovered. Where am I, said he? What has happened? Oh, yes, yes, I recollect now. Heaven forgive me. He rose, and we walked up to the grave. What again was our astonishment and horror to find that instead of the dead body of my mother-in-law, as we had expected, there was lying over the remains of my poor sister a large white she-wolf. The white wolf, exclaimed my father, the white wolf which decoyed me into the forest. I see it all now. I have dealt with the spirits of the Hart's Mountains. For some time my father remained in silence and deep thought. He then carefully lifted up the body of my sister, replaced it in the grave, and covered it over as before, having struck the head of the dead animal with the heel of his boot and raving like a madman. He walked back to the cottage, shut the door, and threw himself on the bed. I did the same, for I was in a stupor of amazement. Early in the morning we were both roused by a loud knocking at the door, and in rushed the hunter, Velfred. "'My daughter! Man, my daughter! Where is my daughter?' cried he in a rage. "'Where the wretch, the fiend, should be, I trust,' replied my father, starting up and displaying equal collar. "'Where she should be in hell! Leave this cottage, or you may fare worse!' "'Ha, <laughs> ha!' replied the hunter. "'Would you harm a potent spirit of the heart's mountains? Poor mortal, who must needs wed a werewolf!' Out, demon, I defy thee in thy power, yet shall you feel it. Remember your oath, your solemn oath, never to raise your hand against her to harm her. I made no compact with evil spirits. You did, and if you failed in your vow, you were to meet the vengeance of the spirits. Your children were to perish by the vulture, the wolf. Out, out, demon, and the bones blanch in the wilderness. Ha, <laughs> ha. My father, frantic with rage, seized his axe and raised it over Velfred's head to strike. All this, I swear, continued the huntsman mockingly. The axe descended, but it passed through the form of the hunter, and my father lost his balance and fell heavily on the floor. Mortal, said the hunter, striding over my father's body. We have power over those only who have committed murder. You have been guilty of a double murder. You shall pay the penalty attached to your marriage vow. Two of your children are gone. The third is yet to follow, and follow them he will, for your oath is registered. Go, it were kindness to kill thee. Your punishment is that you live. End of the Werewolf by H. B. Marriott